Expedition 44 here with Dr. Ryan and Pastor Matt Muzakis, and we have a guest today. Matt, you want to tell us a little bit about our guest? All right, this is Dr. Jonathan Pritchett. Um, he's from Trinity Theological Seminary and College of the Bible, and he has uh, been, uh, most of my classes I've taken have been with him, and this is the school that I attend, and he was the chair for my thesis, and a good friend as well. He's came and done an apologetics conference at our church, and uh, I just, on top of being a professor, I consider him a good friend. So, uh, yeah. Jonathan, want to tell us a little bit about yourself? And I, I want to first say that you can, you can attest that being my good friend didn't mean I was easy on you in your thesis, does it? <laughs> yep, it doesn't, not at all. <laughs> uh, mark that up real good in, yep. in, the, in the early stages. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so I'm vice president here at Trinity College of Bible Theological Seminary and professor. Uh, I teach courses in biblical studies and apologetics. I co-host the Trinity Radio podcast with Dr. Braxton Hunter, who is the president of Trinity, and you can find us on YouTube, just search Trinity Radio. And in addition to that, um, I've got a wife and three kids and a bunch of chickens and some dogs, so. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Good. Well, today we are launching into a series on hermeneutics on our Expedition 44 YouTube channel, and this is the first of those, which is an introduction to hermeneutics. And so a lot of people kind of understand what that word means, that it's a study of theory and methodology of interpreting scripture. But I don't think too many people really understand the complexities that are involved with accomplishing that. There's a lot of understanding and communication and linguistics and things like that that comes into it. And hermeneutics itself is, is simply translating and interpreting, but there's presuppositions and pre-understandings and exegesis is what most people think is the primary part of it, but it's really a lot broader than that. And then you kind of get into some ideas of Jewish and biblical hermeneutics where there, there's some overlap there, but there's also some very different interpretive traditions that you have to take yeah. into thought. And then there's literal, moral, allegorical, and a whole bunch of other things. Now, we're not going to try to tackle all that today. We might, you know, touch base on some of it. But uh, Dr. Pritchett, what what do you find when your students start and they're they're getting into hermeneutics? Where, how do you introduce this to them? Well, uh, the first way, the first thing I do when, in my hermeneutics class is I talk. What are we talking about uh, when we're talking about what the Bible is? Right. So, in in one sense, the Bible is an anthology of documents from antiquity, you know, written over 14 to 1600 years, right? Um, but another thing that we're talking about is for, for conservative, the, theologically conservative Christians like myself, we're also talking about God's inspired word uh, to a particular people at a particular time, but for God's people at all particular times in subsequent history. So if you believe that the Bible is inspired and, and, and God's truthful word to, to his people and for his people, then, then it's not, we're not just talking about documents from antiquity, but we're talking about sacred scripture for believers insofar as faith and practice. So right interpretation is very important when it comes to scripture. Now you touched on a couple of things in your opening remarks about exegesis and uh, hermeneutics. Uh, one of the things I like to clear up early is that there is a difference between the two. And so exegesis is drawing out from the text its meaning. But the, the, the easiest way to explain the difference is exegesis is what the text meant. But the task of hermeneutics is to come to, come to understand what the text means. Because the text can't mean something it never meant, but it has mm -hmm. to mean something for our lives today. So, so how do you cross that bridge from what it meant then to what it means for us now? And I think that, that process is, 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 is what encompasses hermeneutics, whereas exegesis is just one part of that. Because we can talk all day about what a text meant in its original context, and that's, uh, for many of us, our favorite part. But, but when, you start, when you start the task of, of putting together theological ideas from, from what it meant, you, you are now drawing inferences from the text, right? Because the text doesn't give us what a systematic theology textbook would give us. It doesn't give us what an ethics manual would give us. You have to draw that out in your hermeneutics to, to say that this is what it meant then, and this is how to rightly 
understand what it means for us, and then also go apply it to our lives. So that that process is is the hermeneutic process. So what most uh, conservative Christians will, will say is we use what's called the grammatical historical method, which is understanding what the author intended it to mean in its original context. And you start from there and you build those bridges to, to what it means for us today. So. That's good. And you kind of get into these thoughts of, you know, are we talking about equivalent translations? Are we going more dynamic in the translations? And there, there seems to be all these different layers that we have to take into account to get the idea that the that was intended when it was written and then how that formulates to us. And so you you mentioned the grammatical historical. What about uh, socio rhetorical? Well, I, I would say that the socio rhetorical method fits pretty well within um, grammatical historical or grammatical historical is a theologically conservative to- coined term that essentially has the same goal as what is called historical criticism. It's just that historical criticism um, is, has a different set of starting presuppositions. Those who, who do historical criticism uh, under that banner do not treat the Bible as God's word. They just treat it like any other historical document. They presuppose naturalism as a methodology, even if, even if they are Christians. Um, they don't interpret it as a Christian for the purposes of, of their vocational work or whatever. So yeah. grammatical historical hermeneutics differs from that in the starting presuppositions, but how it plays out, you're still trying to understand the, how the original author, uh, what he meant, what he intended by his text, and what, um, what his original audience would have understood. Um, and that's what historical criticism tries to do as well, but just from a different starting place. And so they, you can't come to different conclusions. But okay. socio, socio-rhetorical uh, criticism, and I know the word criticism sometimes throws people. It's not. It's not like you're being harsh or critical. Uh, it's just the term that we use for unpacking things. Um, the the socio rhetorical method fits within that, but I think that the method uh, also shores up some of the shortcomings of the historical criticism uh, and and or from the conservative side, the grammatical historical. Because in the grammatical historical uh, approach, one of the shortcomings is sometimes we can overemphasize grammar to the neglect of the historical part. But yeah. but also within just saying historical, historical tends to deal with trivia and facts of of the ancient world, data, things that you can find on Wikipedia. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't give you the, the mental categories and the philosophical categories and what we call the sociocultural categories of not just what happened in the past, but how people thought in the past at particular times and particular places. What was their worldview like? And how do you reconstruct that? And I think the socio-rhetorical method, because of the way it's designed, is set up to keep you on, at least according to the, the person who originated the model, uh, his name, a lot of things fly under the banner of socio-rhetorical interpretation now, but the, the person who originated the model, uh, his name is Vernon Robbins, he's at um, Emory, he he has five textures that, that he, in the interpretive process that you go through with any passage, and then um, William Brosand introduced a sixth texture um, at a meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature that got Robin's blessing. So you have six textures or layers by which you go through a text to make sure you draw out all the the nuance. And, and, and this, this is kind of like a device of interpretation or maybe a, a formulation of understanding the text. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's, it's just another method. There's a lot of, I mean, you, you have postmodern hermeneutics, you have feminist hermeneutics, you've got li- liberation hermeneutics. There's, there's all kinds of different different things out there. But this one fits more, is not a deconstructive uh, sort of hermeneutic method. It, it's more in line with the historical criticism method. It's just, okay. it's just casting its, its, its uh, net a little bit wider to make sure you can get the fullest impact of any text and understand what it meant. And then that helps us to draw in what it means for us. So I, I'm a fan of the method. Um, like all methods, it can be abused. There's uh, conservative biblical scholars and liberal biblical scholars who use this method, and they do come to different conclusions. But again, that's that's dependent on their starting points, not necessarily the method itself, if that makes sense. But you also mentioned translations, and it's important to say that translations are also interpretations, and you mm-hmm. have different kinds. You have word for word, thought for thought, and there's a spectrum, you know. And I, some of us favor the more uh, literal translations, but that can be misleading as well because some of the nuances of figures of speech and so forth get lost in trying to be too word for word, whereas thought for thought or taking a little bit of license to communicate an idiom or an expression in a contemporary way that 
that fits with what it meant in the original, but is worded differently in our text so that we can understand what he was actually saying is yeah. actually, is actually better than using um, uh, a word for word in, in those cases. That's why there's a spectrum and you want to find somewhere on the spectrum that, that leans more towards word for word, but not at the expense of understanding the meaning that was in, in, in that at least the translation committee thinks was intended by that. So um, a good, a good uh, example of this, just so people are tracking or let's, let's take Psalm 17 and the NASB says, uh, keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. So it's using apple of the eye. Well, the CSU says, protect me as the pupil of your eye. And a lot of right. people would go, you know, let's try to make sense out of that. Well, in, a, in our American culture, we kind of understand the apple of my, of the eye. So is that right. a good translation in our culture? Maybe, but when you actually look at what it was saying is the Hebrew word there is apple of the eye, pupil. It's the, the word actually means pupil. So the CSU kind of got it closer to the literal word, but we would read the pupil of my eye and go, that doesn't yeah, really make it, any it, sense. Yeah, that's why I, I tend to favor the apple. It's not the most literal, but what yeah. it, it's more literal in the sense, not word for word, but it's more literal in the sense that we can understand the expressive uh, nature of the sentiment, and it registers with us more than saying, that's the pupil of my eye. Right, because what right. I said, it's pupil, apple of my eye is center of attention, center of focus. Yeah. And while that made sense in Hebrew, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't hit us in the same way as our own idiom, which actually closer communicates the original meaning than using a heart. So, so whenever you hear someone say that they, every time I just want a, you know, I want something like Young's literal, where, which is actually turns out not to be the best at that either, but they want something that's just word for word for word. I'm like, no, you, you really don't. Um, yeah. Because, because uh, you can lose a lot. Um, yeah. And there's, there's like minor examples that just make for poor reading. So um, instead of having Jesus say fishers of men, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, I will have you fish for people. And that's just <laughs> literal. And, and a, from a literary critic perspective, that's just bad writing. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I wasn't a fan of that because fishers of men is, keeps the wordplay that Jesus was intending. Right. Yeah. So, so, be careful for, for, for all. The, and I, I understand. I like the word for words. I like it to lean on that side of the spectrum, but I'm not all for that because I, uh, I tend to still like to read my Bibles in English. Um, yeah, I know yeah. we're all scholars like, Oh, I read the great new Testament. No, I don't read the great new Testament. I do. You know, <laughs> I spend most of my day doing, you know, uh, work, you know, yeah. I, I do tedious paperwork more than, than as much research as I'd like, but, you know, I do devotionals with my family. Uh, I do devotions with my friends and stuff. So I, I don't spend all my day reading from the Greek New Testament. And admittedly, my Hebrew gets worse every year. So it's And like, even I, if you understand Greek and Hebrew, I mean, even yeah. if you say you know it really well, you're still going to have a hard time with the cultural part of that. You know, the understanding of what, what it meant within that language. You alluded to a word play there. Like, yeah. you know, I, I'm pretty good at Hebrew, not very good at Greek. And I, and I look at that and so many times, you know, you're, you're going to miss the cultural part there if you're just trying to literally translate. And I almost get to the point where, where people are so stuck on the literal, I almost want to throw a book at them every time they yeah. say that. Well, uh, uh, the history of the church shows that, that, that even the best uh, 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 scholars, people who know the biblical language is far better than, than I do, uh, can eisegete uh, and misinterpret the Greek and Hebrew as bad as you can in English or Spanish or any translated receptor language. I mean, people can butcher the Bible in any language, including the original. So knowing Greek and Hebrew doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that, that you know what that text is talking about. Because if you don't know the sociocultural data, then you're going to read bad ideas into the Greek just as much as you would in the English. So it, yeah. it, it, it's important. And we do stress languages. We're, we've put Matt through the languages. You know, you need to, you need to know that stuff. Yep. <laughs> But it's and not, it even gets more complicated yeah. when people don't even really know how the English language works. I mean, if you had a hard time in 10th grade English class and now you're trying to understand English and Hebrew and Greek, you're, 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 there's a lot of people that just really struggle with this whole thing. Yeah, yeah one uh, thing when I was taking uh, Greek, it made me a lot better at English. Right. <laughs> yeah. the, the first, the first, in your Greek textbook, the first several chapters of it give you a refresher on English. On, on, on English. Yeah, so yep. you know how grammar works because, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So going back to the cultural stuff and how important that was, that's one thing that you stressed over and over in your hermeneutics class and yeah. even in our New Testament background. Some book you recommended, I think it was one of our textbooks, Honor, Patronage, Kinship, yes. and Security, one of the 
one of the best books I've ever read. Yes. Um, that really opened my eyes to a whole new way of, I guess, unpacking and looking hermeneutically at the, the New Testament. So would you talk to maybe some of those concepts and why they're important for our interpretation of the Bible, especially the New Testament? Sure. Um, well, that book, I highly commend that to everybody. I've been singing that book's praises for almost 20 years now. Um, it, it's a fantastic book by David De Silva. And what it does is it gives you uh, four major building blocks for your framework of understanding the New Testament. And I would say that John Walton's uh, um, book on, on uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, and the Old Testament, are you familiar with that book by Walton? Yeah, um, it was a textbook for your Old Testament backgrounds. Book. Right, and that would be kind of a good primer for Old Testament. The, for Old Testament, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the New Testament is not just, when we think about the ancient Mediterranean world, we're not just talking about the first century time. So when we're, when we're talking about history, we can, we can understand historical facts of what happened um, in, in the past. So we know, uh, for example, uh, that around 49 or so, Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome, right? That, that's a historical fact. But what that doesn't tell you is what they thought about that. It doesn't tell you how that, that impacted the cultural dynamics between Jews and Gentiles in Rome. It doesn't tell you their thought categories. It doesn't tell you uh, anything other than just the bare brute fact that that event happened but it tells you nothing about why. It tells you nothing about what they thought about. It tells you nothing about how that, those interactions took place. It tells you nothing about the thought categories of religion and, and, and the dynamics of, of, of different groups and how they shook out the world. So what this book does um, is it gives you four basic building blocks. So in the ancient world, it's um, different from the modern world in the sense that uh, we'll take the first one, honor. Honor and shame were uh, important values. Right. Those were the, the main values, everything operated within that. Whereas in like the modern Western world, like um, like the United States, for example, we're a guilt culture. So so we think in terms of more introspective in, internal guilt that, oh, I did something. So I internally I feel guilty. But in the ancient world, what was more important than how you felt, because that they were less, if not completely lacking in any sort of introspective way that we do now that if you did something that was viewed as shameful in the ancient world, that's worse than you feeling bad about it. It means that mm -hmm. if you did something like, if you stole bread, for example, well, you may or may not feel guilty about that, even though that you know that stealing is wrong. But what, what you will do is you will feel shame and embarrassment and humiliation if you get caught, because not only yeah. if you get caught, you bring shame upon everyone in your household. And depending on the type of thing that you do, you could bring shame to everyone in your community and everyone, you know, of your people. So shame was more important in, 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 in getting rid of shame uh, and hiding the shame, you know, because you would more likely cover it up than you would feel bad. And so like when I was a kid, I shoplifted and my mom caught me shoplifting those little pieces of bubble gum that they would have at the cash register. And so I, I, I felt uh, bad when I was caught, but I didn't feel bad for stealing it. Right. So my mom had to endure the shame and embarrassment for what I did as, you know, six or seven years old. And I have to go up there with back then it was like a nickel or whatever and apologize and say, I did something wrong. And my mom has standing there, you know, and so I brought shame to my mother, you know, and shame to myself and, Oh no, what is pe people in our community going to think? Cause my, my son is stealing. Well, amplify that by a thousand and that's kind of how they thought but shame also had a second function shame was the motivator to keep you from stealing the candy because you didn't want to bring shame on yourself you didn't want to bring shame on on your family and so forth so shame has a positive function as well to keep you in line with the values of your family and the values of your people now honor uh honor there's two ways to get honor because that's that that's above wealth that's above everything in the ancient world so the way that you get honor is you you have acquired honor that which you can get for yourself by doing acts of nobility that 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 people see and they pray give you praise and glory for because you did you did what what the the group thinks is esteem you know esteemable and all that so they, they give you honor that way um so you can acquire honor but you also have what's called an ascribed honor and this has to do with uh, who your parents are, what your vocation is, 
you know, because typically sons did what their fathers did, right? Uh, so what city you were born in. So when it's asked of Jesus, can anything good come from Nazareth? What's happening there is that the overall sentiment for people who are not from Nazareth think that that's, there's nothing good there. And that, that, that reputation goes for everyone who's, who's there, whether they're honorable or not. You know, outside, uh, you know, uh, Paul cites the Cretan poets said Cretans are lazy gluttons and liars. Right. And Paul's like, yeah, true enough. Right. I mean, just kind of that's that's what we all think of them. Right. He's just yeah, that's true. So you have reputations and you're you're given uh, ascribed honor based on that. So if you start with a deficit because you're from a, uh, a disreputable place by most accounts of outsiders, you have a family that has uh a very low honor rating, even within that, you start with a huge deficit. Now, what makes this um, important is because, take the Gospels, for example, we find, or at least I have found that people glaze over uh, Jesus's genealogy, for example, right? Because you have to remember this, uh, these Gospels come, are written after Jesus's ministry, right? Jesus has already ascended into heaven and the Gospel writers uh, some 30 years or more later are now writing these gospel accounts. Even all the epistles have been written, everything. So they're giving Jesus his genealogy. Well, what do people know about Jesus other than the claim that he was resurrected? Well, he was crucified as a criminal. He lived in Nazareth. He had to flee Egypt. All of these things are deficits. So what do they do in the genealogy and tell the, tell the origins? They, they, they give this, in, well, Luke goes all the way back to Adam, but you know, uh, Matthew will start with Abraham. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to up his ascribed honor rating best they can by going through his entire genealogy and saying, look at all of these heroes of, of Judaism. You know? So just because you know him as the guy from Nazareth, right? Well, he's born in Bethlehem, city of David. He has all the, you know, he's in that lineage, all, all of this stuff. They're trying to build up at the very beginning of Matthew and Luke's gospel, Jesus is ascribed honor. And that's why they go through that. Because if, you, if, if you're from the ancient world and you're not a part of the Christian community, you see a lot of strikes against him. That's why Paul would say that, you know, Jews, they need signs and wonders about this fellow being of God. And Gentiles think it's complete nonsense. Uh, you know, it's folly to the Gentiles. Why is that? Well, these cultural dynamics help you understand that. And it gets a little bit more complicated because within honor and shame, what one group finds honorable behavior, sex with temple prostitutes, for example. That's, yeah, good, good, go do that. Well, in the Christian community, that's shameful behavior. What, <laughs> how do you unite with that? You know, your body is a temple. You can't be uniting with all that kind of stuff. So what one group thinks is honorable behavior, another group thinks is shameful behavior and vice versa. Uh, in the ancient world, they expected people to give deference to all of these local gods whenever they were, you know, that's, that's and, and of course to Caesar, who was claiming divinity by this point. So, so if you're not doing that, you're going to, for, for pagans, you're going to make our gods angry and they're going to, you know, hurl lightning bolts at our city or something. You can't do, so if you don't behave in a certain way, we're, we have to ostracize you. And so that's where a lot of the persecution comes from. Well, but it makes sense for the Christian looking at it from our Christian perspective. Now we don't live in that context, but you right. can think, you can think if somebody asked Matt to go sleep with a temple prostitute to appease some gods or make a request for rain or whatever else, he's going to be offended and, and the church will be offended. And if he did it, the whole church would be offended by that kind of activity if he went and did that. And certainly his wife yeah. would too. So you can't, you can't behave like that because that's shameful behavior. But if you're not a Christian, that's actually honorable behavior. So you have these different groups and they have different ideas of what is honorable and shameful. And so what you see in letters like 1 Corinthians and others in the Bible, what you see Paul doing is trying to reverse the cultural norms of what's honorable and, be, and shameful. He even has to do it with himself. He's wearing the fact that he's been beaten in the face and he's wearing, you know, talking about how the fact that he's been shipwrecked and he's been thrown in prison, all these. These are what outsiders would say was shameful. He's trying to show that because he was doing it in service of the Lord that this was honorable actions. So and we kind of we kind of get lucky with the New yeah. Testament because it covers a relatively short span of time and it's kind of a circular view that way. We only have to cover 70 years. And although there are different cultures within the New Testament, as you very strongly alluded to, you get into the Old Testament and, you know, you start getting into Hebrew and looking into the, the fuller ages and, you know, not to be confused yeah. with dispensationalism, but there's, you know, a lot broader of a section you have to try to wrap your, your, arms around so to speak right and one of the things we have to hammer home to people that the uh, 
Jewish thought of the first century is not like Jewish thought of Isaiah, which is not like Jewish thought. Right. Of, the, the cultures change over yeah. time, you know, a lot slower, but you can still, I, I, I would argue, you can still get down to basics of fundamental principles. And I think honor, shame, kinship, purity, um, patronage, more so in the Greco-Roman era than the Old Testament, but you can still see hints of that. But, but the, especially purity, uh, both testaments, that, that's a big factor. What is profane versus what is sacred? Now, how those play out differ in cultures and how they were applied differ in cultures, but those fundamental basics are there. So I, that's why I like this book, because no matter what you're talking about, if you're reading anything from Homer, you know, on forward through probably the third or fourth century, uh, this book will help you understand all of that too. So when you start thinking in categories of honor and shame, you can start understanding why they're saying certain things that they're saying and see how those dynamics play in the text. Yeah. So you have to understand the culture. You have to know where and what it was being written to. If there's a, a circular letter like Paul often did, he's probably trying to hit on a few different levels of that too. But then, then you go back to what happens when you get to something like first and second Peter, where he uses a lot of these words that we just don't have anywhere else, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, whether you look at, you know, in the old Testament, there's, there's linguistics that's called a, a hopex legomenon, and there's 1500 of those in the old Testament, but you look at, you know, first and second Peter, and I, you know, there's, I think there's more than 50 of those in those two books. And so things even continue to get more complex. And I think when you're, you know, in your first or second year of studies, you're looking at this going, how can I possibly bring understanding to all these things that I don't understand. Yeah, that's, it's a, and hopox legato means one occurrence. So, so it happens, it's a word that shows up once in the Bible. Now, and then you have the dis, the tris, and the tetricus, which is double, yeah. triple, and quadruple. And those, those are yeah. just as concerning in many ways. Yeah, and, and so you sometimes you want to go into, so for those of us who have uh, Logos Bible software, and you can download a bunch of... Uh, documents from antiquity that are uh, in greek or latin you know from the mediterranean world uh, all that greco-roman literature you can start looking up words in greek that how they're used in other contexts uh, in other writings outside of the bible to help you kind of figure out what these words mean yeah a little intertextuality goes yeah. a long ways there but sometimes that ends up not helping much because take uh one example would be pro or so for the our word that we translate predestined, right, as a, as a verb. Well, it turns out if you do a search for that, you don't find a whole lot. You, know, you, you go to, you, you, you find Plutarch, who was a contemporary of Paul. That's a good, good one to look, and uh, Morelia. And in there, he's writing about how people would predestine getting together to have conversations of free thought, right? And you're like, well, that has... Nothing new before time. <laughs> right. Well, what is, what is, yeah, now you're struggling. Okay, so that, that word about people getting together to talk and predestining, uh, and then you find some Christian uh, literature that, that uses that word. So you're like, oh, man. So so turns out that a lot of times when you see these words and you, and you go look for them outside of the Bible, they don't mean what theologians have told you they meant. You know? Right. You got to figure out where did they get all of the, the, this other stuff they'll say, well, in the context, well, then you go to the context and you're like, yeah, but that's still, <laughs> you know, so you're like, so you have this word predestined. It just means, you know, to arrange or mark out before. So when you start memorizing Greek, you kind of learn what most of these Greek words mean. They call that the gloss, so to speak. And you get to a point where all these things that you think they mean all of a sudden might not mean what you thought they meant. Yeah, or, or you have to do a little bit more work to see how they, you know, because now you're not just exegeting scripture, now you're exegeting Greco-Roman documents, and you're trying yeah. to figure out what that, <laughs> so then your research doubles, because, you know, if you're going to dig into a biblical text and try to understand what these words mean in context, you can't just do a surface reading of an extra biblical document and think, oh, well, now I know what this means because I read it at face value. So now I can help mm -hmm. it. No, now you got to do the same diligence that you did with that document that you did with that you're doing with the Bible. So it now what I what I want to stop here and say is can you read your English translation and get a gist of what it's saying? Yes. No problem. Absolutely. I don't dispute that. Now what you think it might be saying, you could be wrong if you <laughs> and for more than what it says. That's where people get in. 
if you can read a sentence from the Bible, you can understand it in English. That doesn't mean you understand any sort of implications of that sentence correctly, but you can understand and get a gist of what it's about. Um, but you, the amount that you miss by not learning at least some basics of hermeneutics, and I would count, I count uh, De Silva's book, for example, books like that. It's not a hermeneutics book technically, but it is a book that aids in exegesis and hermeneutics. Like you can't do it unless you know this stuff. You can't yeah. do it well. Um, so that's, a, that's what I'm saying. You, the amount that you miss from, from reading the Bible because you're not aware of these sociocultural dynamics and the categories of thought that they, that they had in the ancient Mediterranean world. You know, we've just talked about one. Uh, patronage is a big one because we use grace language. That's a, we think of that as a big religious word right? Um, and we sing hymns about God's amazing grace, and we should, but most people don't realize that that's not a religious word. It's uh, a word coined to represent the ethos of a s economic system called patronage between patrons and clients and a reciprocity that was represented by the charities, which is three dancing half-naked pagan goddesses. <laughs> so you're like, oh, wait a minute, what, what, are we, what are we saying by grace? Well, we want to make sure that what we're saying by grace is what the New Testament authors understood by grace, right? And, and for them, if you're not talking about beauty, you know, what you're talking about is a disposition or, or an ethos that's related to people who needed things that they couldn't secure on their own, receiving with, with what we would say social strings attached, not no strings attached, there are social strings attached to it, uh, and an a, and a expectation of ethos between the giver of the gift giving something, which makes him honorable, by the way, that's an honorable thing to give, give, give. Uh, and the receiver who is to, to be loyal to that person who gave them something they could not get on their own. So people think that, that grace means unmerited favor, right? That's a common definition. Well, grace can be unmerited because patrons can give to whomever they wish. Sometimes patrons give because they believe somebody merited it because of their honorable behavior. So you think about texts like God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, it's something about that humility that I, I know this word is loaded with Protestant Catholic arguments from 400 years ago. But if you, if you take yourself out of 16th century conversations and have a first century conversation, God is happy to, to reward certain behaviors. He just does. That's his prerogative as the patron that he's going to give uh, grace. He's going to give gifts, so to speak. And gifts can be physical, material, whatever. So in the ancient world, if you're a farmer and your crops have uh, been destroyed by some natural disaster or whatever, and you don't have uh, money for seed and to, to, to start all over, or your land is unusable, so you need some new land or something. Well, you don't have the money to secure that. But what you can do is you can find uh, a benefactor or a patron who will provide that for you. And he will be happy to, if he so chooses to give that without, and his thinking is, you know, he gives that to them. And this person has a social expectation. Now it's kind of weird because when they talk about, if you're a patron, you should give without any expectation of return, right? That's, that's supposed to be the 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 facade of that and then and then the the mentality of the uh, of the receiver though if you're the client of, of the, if you give this you have to do everything you can to show your gratitude and pay it back even though you, it's impossible for you to pay it back so they go in opposite directions these social ethos of this so i give because i'm so benevolent and everyone's you know i'm 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 all this. I'm I'm super nice and generous, and that <clears> makes you know that makes me look good. You don't say that out loud. And the other person is like, I'm so undeserving of this, and I'm going to walk around the city when I'm not working, planting the crops in this field that he gave me, talking about how awesome that guy is, and I'm going to be loyal to him. <clears throat> and that's how it works. The main thing about grace is not that you deserve it or don't deserve it, even though as sinners we don't deserve God's grace. I mean, that's fine to say that. But the main thing is, and the main thing that they're stressing is is that. Grace is that what you receive that you couldn't secure on your own, right? That's the main thing. Like, like we, the reason we cannot escape death, right? Death is coming for us all, but you can have eternal life through Christ in the defeat of death and participate in that and participate in the life of Christ and then the future resurrection and new heavens and new earth. So 
you can't do that on your own. So you, you can't earn it. You know, we think about the wages of sin is death. Wages is economic language, right? The, the word works of Torah, works is, is economic language, works and wages. If you work for God, works of Torah, you get your wages, right? You, wages the one, given to the one who's owed. Paul talks about this in Romans 4. So this is all economic language more than religious language. Now, it has religious importance. It has religious uh, significance, and we don't want to minimize that. But what we want to do is we want to maximize it so we understand what's going on in these texts. Yeah. Because you, you have works, you have grace. Why are those juxtaposed? Why does Paul talk about slavery and, and being a slave to sin or a slave of righteousness, you, you know, a uh, slave of Jesus Christ? That's all economic language. Yeah. You, you, so, could, you could be employed. You can, you, by someone else, and do work and receive your wages. You can be a slave, you know, or you can receive benefits uh, of grace, you know, from a patron. And so Yahweh is cast as our ultimate patron, right? So he relativizes the Jew, the Greek, the rich, the poor, the male, the female. Everyone's relativized because God is the giver of all good things, and he makes us all part of family. So, yeah. Well, Dr. Pritchett, I think you've done a great job of helping us understand a lot of the complexities of interpretation, trying to understand. And I, there's kind of two views of this. You have the scholarly idea that is just happy to dive into interpretation. They just, they mm. just want to understand. But then you have the other side, which I think most of our viewers are on, where they hear these things of rules or laws of interpretation, and their end goal is, is simply to give glory to God. They're kind of trying to formulate a theology, so to speak, in their mind of how all these different scriptures work themselves out and, and might get to, in some way, a form of doctrine or a way to live. What, yeah. what do you think about the difference between those two? Well, to try to understand theological implications, for those of us who are in the socio-rhetorical school of, of interpretation, that um, is the fifth texture. That's for, so for people like Matt and I, there's four other things that we go through before we start with that, right? To make yeah. sure that that's right. And I think it's it's good that that comes last. But people too often, they think that they're doing exegesis, but what they're just doing is a sacred reading of the text. They're what's called yeah. a sacred text. They're just reading. And if they already have a systematic theology in mind, guess what they find in the text that they're reading? But they already <laughs> believed, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so... Uh, you could get into a little bit of trouble there by not checking that against uh, things because we think we read the Bible because it is God's word. We read it with so many different ideas than we would read other ancient documents. But if you don't do that first, I'm going to read this like any other book without making grand sweeping claims about how the universe works because of a sentence I read in the Bible at random, <laughs> right? Like you see the word predestination and you think all of these big major metaphysical ideas and stuff. It's like, yeah. oh, slow down. You haven't gotten there yet, you know? So you're getting to the point, which is why we invited you to this episode. Yeah. You represent Trinity, who your, your goal is to understand the Bible and to apply that. And yeah. what I hear a lot when people watch our videos is where do I even start? You know, I, you guys are talking about this stuff. Do I need to learn Greek? Do I need to learn Hebrew? You know, uh, God is the most important thing in my life. And I want to understand this relational word that he gave us. So how do we possibly do that? And what you're doing is you're, you're essentially putting your life and your, your career and everything, answering that question for people. So where, what's your advice to somebody who, who legitimately wants this to be the focus of their life? Yeah. Here's the good news. Even though what I'm saying sounds complicated, you can get it. You can, you can understand everything you need to know by reading three books, three books. We've mentioned two of them already. And then I would say, just read how to read God's word for all it's worth or how to read the Bible for all it's worth by yep. uh, Stuart and fee. And then add that uh, Walton's book, uh, which I recommend last, um, actually. I know I love the Old Testament, but I think, I think it's easier to start with the New Testament. Yeah, and we've uh, had Walton on the show as well, too, and yeah. we're big fans of all of his work. So I would read How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Then I would read um, De Silva's book, and then I'd read Walton's book, the one that we recommended earlier. And if you... So Christians are people of the book. You don't need to go learn Greek. You don't need to learn Hebrew. You don't need to have a... A, a theological degree to understand your Bible. But if you want to go deeper than just reading your Bible, okay, I, you're going to have to read other books. There's no way around that. 
But if you like to read your Bible, then you like to read. So go read these other books um, because they will help you. Those, those three books is, I think is all most lay people would need to invest in. Um, we're talking about three books. They're all what less than 300 pages. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, you could knock that out in three months, you know, and, and you will have in And in fact, y'all should just teach in local churches. You should do a book, study and 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 study these books you know um that's one of the things that we emphasize in, in all of our classes here is don't just learn this for you we we give our powerpoints presentations to our students and say take this modify it change it do whatever go teach it to your churches because it, it's it can't and it, it can't be just for your own edification it's got to be for the benefit of others if theological education is only benefiting you then go to another seminary where you can entertain yourself. But this is for, <laughs> this is for, this is for building up the church because not everyone gets to go to seminary, right? Yeah. Not everyone gets to learn Greek and Hebrew. Um, but that's and fine. So lastly, tell us a little bit about what Trinity does and how that might be shaped a little bit differently than uh, what you're recommending to the normal person. Well, uh, Trinity, we, uh, depends on the degree program, but in the biblical studies department, we focus on exegesis and hermeneutics in every biblical studies course. They're all designed to help you get more out of the biblical text. So when we're talking about the backgrounds of the New Testament, we're talking about the backgrounds of the Old Testament, we're talking about intertextuality and uh, the, the, the New Testament use of the Old Testament. Uh, we talk about primary source studies and how ancient documents from, from the ancient Near Eastern world and the ancient Mediterranean world, how those help fill in our understanding of scripture so non-canonical books you know also play a big role especially greco-roman literature and second temple judaism how, how all those, those jewish writings the apocrypha the pseudepigrapha how those help us understand the the soup of, of the ancient world that the bible is speaking into you know it's it's just and where the Bible fits in it, how is it similar to these other things? Where do they differ? What are the contrasts? What are they, what are they speaking to try to align people to their side? What are they rejecting that's common in, 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 in their audiences, you know, in their Jewish opponents, their Greco-Roman opponents, you know? Uh, to die is to gain, Paul says. Well, he's echoing Plato there, right, from the, from the Apology. So you get these intertextuality and it's not just, well, what did the New Testament people say about Old Testament Bible verses? No, that's it's, it's bigger than that. Um, it's, it's way bigger than that. It's, it's also these other, uh, not just the things in like Acts 17, you know, is a familiar one where Paul uh, quotes pagan poets and all that. No, that stuff's littered in there, you know? And, and so we go through all of that. Um, but that's just because we're nerds. That's what we're supposed to do in, in, in seminary is go for all that. But I, one of the things that we stress at Trinity is, is you get to learn all of this really fascinating stuff, but you don't get to keep it to yourself because at Trinity, we are big on all of our students being active local church members and teaching others what they are learning. You know, don't hoard it for yourselves. If people in the church that are listening to this that are not seminarians, the good news is go to a church with people who are willing to teach you this stuff if you want to learn it and help you go through books like the ones that we mentioned so that you can be a better reader of your own Bible that you love to read. And I, I want people who love to read their Bible to get more, not less out of it. So that's where we get to assist those. Now, not everyone in the church is interested in that. And I want to say, I want to say a word of defense of those people too. You don't have to, you don't have to, if you're happy, just listening to your you version audio i'm with you i listen to the bible app myself probably as much as i read my text you know if you're fine with that that's fine too i'm not going to knock people that don't want to uh do in-depth bible studies and that all of a sudden cuts out their devotional reading because one of the things that i stress at trinity is don't give up your devotional stuff that, you know, your, your personal time with God is just as important. And for some, for a lot of people, that's fine. For a lot of people, that's not fine. They want to know more. They just don't know how to get more, mm -hmm. but, but they don't have to come to seminary either because they have people like you guys who are there, who, who should be there. And I think that you are, uh, who are there to help go through these other types of books that we recommend. So, so yeah, that, I mean, that's what we do at Trinity. Our focus is oh, the, the, the end of all Trinity is to glorify God through the church. That's what we want to do. We want to edify the church uh, with our student body. We don't want to just entertain people who have an intellectual itch to scratch. Great. Well, 
Dr. Pritchett, thank you for what you do. Thank you for joining yeah. us on our show today. Really appreciate uh, everything you added to our intro launch on hermeneutics. Pastor Matt, thanks as well for, uh, for making this, this episode. And we're looking forward to the future episode on interpretation and hermeneutics. If you want to hear our learn more about Trinity, trinitystem.edu. Is that correct, Jonathan? Yes. Yep. And can't you audit courses also? Do you still have that? We do. Uh, for $35, you can audit uh, our courses uh, at Trinity. And you will see not just the video lectures, but you'll see the assigned textbooks and you'll see even what the assignments are. And if you get to thinking, hey, I can, I can handle that, then you can sign up for a degree program as well. But you don't have to. You can just audit the courses and listen to our lectures. Um, and we go into this kind of stuff in more detail. So, um, for example, uh, my hermeneutics course, my New Testament backgrounds course, and my Old Testament backgrounds course, and my uh, New Testament use of the Old Testament, those are four courses that anyone who wanted to go deeper in Bible study, just listening to the lectures would, I, I think, uh, get you well on your way. I loved so. every single one of those courses. Yeah, <laughs> Good. Great. Very helpful yeah. to me. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Dr. Pritchett. Appreciate My pleasure. you being here. Thanks for chatting with us. Great. May God bless you and keep you. <laughs>